Okay, thanks everyone for coming to um, another talk in the one pass session, a uh, one pass thematic session on um, dynamical systems. Uh, today we're pleased to have with us uh, Marian Judea from Yeshiva University, uh, who will be speaking about topological methods and Hamiltonian instability. Uh, Marian, I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, the previous lectures were more about Hamiltonian stability, so now I would like to say uh, a few words about uh, Hamiltonian instability. And in the title here, I have topological methods and Hamiltonian instability, but I want to give you a warning that, uh, in fact, topological methods will come at the end of the lecture because I want to present them in a, uh, let's say, in a natural context. So uh, this is based on uh, several joint works with uh, Maci Kapinski, Rafael de la Llave, and Teresera. And these are uh, different works and done in different combinations of the co-authors. So um, just to set up the context, uh, we are talking about uh, Hamiltonian uh, dynamical systems. So these are a systems described by a, um, a system by di differential equations in uh, two vector variables, uh, which represent uh, uh, essentially generalized coordinates and generalized uh, momenta. And the equations of motion are uh, given by, are uh, determined by, the, by a single function, the Hamiltonian H. And uh, the meaning of H is the uh, total energy of the system. And uh, the type of equations that I uh, have written here are um, uh, autonomous, so there is no time dependence and uh, the total energy of the system is conserved. And a, uh, uh, the typical phenomenon in Hamiltonian dynamics is that you have uh, stability and instability coexist. So uh, the picture here on the right represents uh, uh, the uh, uh, dynamics of the uh, standard map, which was presented in the uh, previous lecture by uh, Professor Aro. And uh, the focus in his lecture was on stability on KM tori. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this plot is for a, a choice of parameters where uh, uh, basically almost all KM tori disappear. So maybe you see a trace of the KM toros uh, somewhere in, uh, in here. But the focus here is to emphasize the um, mechanism of instability and among which um, you have hyperbolic periodic orbits, so they appear in different places in this plot, and between these hyperbolic periodic orbits, uh, you have uh, uh, <clears throat> stable and unstable manifolds that intersect, creating uh, homoclinic connections. And this is one, ta one mechanism of instability that I will uh, refer uh, later on. So, um, I, I will discuss about uh, uh, some applications of, uh, and I would like to compare stability to instability. So um, for some applications, one is interested in uh, stability. This is the case, for example, of particle accelerators and uh, plasma confinement devices. But for other applications, one would like to exploit instability. And this is the case, for instance, of uh, low energy uh, space missions. So here I'm showing a uh, recent uh, space mission of NASA, which was called GRAIL. And uh, this exploited a mechanism of instability uh, that was developed by uh, my colleague Ed Del Bruno. Uh, and this is referred by uh, the weak stability boundary method. Um, so in general, uh, the Hamiltonian instability problem refers to understanding how uh, small perturbation can produce large effects in a Hamiltonian system. And um, more concretely, uh, we are interested in uh, specific problems. So I give you a concrete system uh, plus a uh, concrete perturbation and a given initial condition. And uh, we'd like to answer questions like, uh, if this initial condition will lead to uh, stability or to instability. Is the effect of the perturbation 
accumulate is going to accumulate or not uh, if we understand uh, this in a uh, general setting we can also ask whether we can design system with with prescribed behavior perhaps for a certain system we want the perturbations to accumulate but for another system uh, we decide we want to design it in a way that the perturbations do not accumulate and a, a more general question is on what is the typical behavior of typical systems and uh, that means what happens to typical orbits and these words uh, typical should be defined in a proper way so um, one of the paradigms paradigms for um, uh, instability is uh, the arnold diffusion problem that was formulated in, in uh, 1964. So this is a, a Hamiltonian system that consists of uh, two parts. One is uh, H0, which represents an integrable system. And uh, the other part is a, a small perturbation that is, this time it's time dependent. So if you only look at the H0 part, integrability means that uh, all solutions are going to lie on invariant tori and the motion on this tori is, uh, is very simple. And uh, the question is to understand what is the uh, effect of the small perturbation. And the conjecture formulated by Arnold was that uh, if you have uh, integrable Hamiltonian system like H0 of uh, uh, more than two degrees of freedom and you uh, add um, small uh, generic perturbations, then there are always some trajectories for which uh, the variable P, or we can alternatively uh, think about the energy A0, uh, changes by an amount which is independent of the size of the perturbation. So in other words, uh, you want, uh, let's say, the energy change by some amount but this amount should be uh, the same, should be predetermined, and uh, should be the same regardless of the size of the perturbation parameter epsilon zero. And uh, related to this problem, uh, uh, Chirikov uh, studied that um, the st uh, statistical distribution of, uh, of the energy or of this uh, variable P so the question was whether if you look at the distribution of this uh, action variable and you let the uh, you, you let this distribution evolve over time and you let the perturbation parameter tend to zero whether uh, this distribution will tend to a uh, uh, diffu standard diffusion process so this was the uh, 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 question formulated by Chirikov, and he supported this by numerical experiments. And what he showed is that uh, what typically happens is that you do not have just one uh, diffusion process that is going on, but depending on the initial conditions that you choose, you may approach different diffusion processes. And I have here this cartoon when um, we start uh, with uh, initial condition uh, near one of these invariant uh, tori for the uh, integrable system and uh, you apply the perturbation and you want to see how the uh, uh, trajectory is spread out and uh, they, you start to see sort of quickly that they, they move in different directions and they uh, more or less uh, look like a random motion and uh, this is essentially the substance of uh, Chirikov questions to prove that uh, this is a, a typical uh, a Brownian motion or a more general diffusion type of process. So uh, the instability phenomena similar to Arnold diffusion also appear in infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system. And I just want to mention that uh, there is um, this uh, well-studied uh, uh, cubic defocusing nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which uh, is represented by an infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system. And uh, 
It has been shown that for this system, one has a uh, instability phenomenon similar to the Arnold diffusion. Essentially, you have uh, some uh, solutions for which, uh, if you look at the growth of Sobolev norm, so at some time t, uh, these norms are much bigger than the initial norm uh, corresponding to time t equal to zero. And uh, I am referring here to some uh, words by uh, Guardia Kaloshin and Guardia Hausen Processi, who provide uh, a geometric understanding of this phenomenon and also provide some uh, quantitative estimates. So uh, instead of talking about uh, instability in general system, I uh, choose to uh, talk about a uh, particular model from celestial mechanics. And celestial mechanics is a good, um, let's say, field or a good topic to study Hamiltonian systems because uh, in space, if you look at uh, uh, spacecraft or uh, uh, asteroids, and other celestial bodies, there is a very little friction, so you can uh, well approximate the dynamics of uh, such bodies by uh, Hamiltonian systems. So I'm focusing on a uh, particular model of the uh, three body problem. So this is called the uh, planar elliptic restricted three body problem. So uh, this refers to the motion of uh, three bodies. Two of them are the main bodies, like primary bodies, and they move on Keplerian ellipses of eccentricity epsilon. So as in this picture, so you can imagine that one of them is the sun and the other one is the planet Jupiter, and they move on um, Keplerian ellipses ab about the uh, center of mass. and um, there is a third body which is uh, of infinitesimal mass and uh, the third body moves under the effect of the gravity of M1 and M2 and, but does not affect uh, the motion of M1 and M2. So uh, this is the planar elliptic restricted three body problem and one typically uh, studies this problem in a particular frame when you fix the position of the uh, Sun and Jupiter on the horizontal axis, so this is like a, a rotating system that moves together with the Sun and Jupiter, and you have them fixed on the horizontal axis, and you study the motion of the uh, spacecraft or of the asteroid uh, relative to this particular frame. And uh, the motion of the, uh, this infinitesimal mass can be described by a time-dependent Hamiltonian system, so which I call H epsilon x t. So t is the time, x is uh, position plus uh, velocity, or position plus momentum, and epsilon, the small parameter here, is the eccentricity of the orbits of the Sun and Jupiter. So this is the Hamiltonian, and when this uh, uh, epsilon parameter, the eccentricity parameter is zero, we get a special case, which is the planar circular restrictive free body problem, in which the uh, bodies, Sun and Jupiter, are assumed to move on circles about the center of mass. So that problem is given by a time-independent Hamiltonian, so if I look at the circular restricted three-body problem, the total energy is preserved because it is, as in the standard presentation of the Hamiltonian system with no, uh, where the vector field, where the Hamiltonian vector field is autonomous. In the um, elliptic restricted three-body problem, we have a dependence of the total energy on time. So uh, in principle, you do not have the conservation of energy. And what you expect is that you, uh, the uh, energy will have, uh, will experience uh, changes of order epsilon over short periods of time. So 
the fact that you have instability of order epsilon, it's uh, kind of obvious, but let me emphasize, uh, let me go back to the uh, general question posed by Arnold, is whether you can have trajectories for which the change of energy is by a constant independent of epsilon for all epsilon sufficiently small. So it's a, a global type of instability that uh, one is asking for. So I'm going to uh, mention uh, two results on the uh, Arnold diffusion. So uh, in this con context of the planar elliptic restricted uh, free body problem. So uh, the first one, it's um, uh, joint work with Maci Kapinski and Rafael Dayave. So in this paper, we can consider the Sun-Jupiter system and we fix uh, uh, the uh, mass ratio. We, for the, uh, we choose the mass ratio, so which is uh, mass of Jupiter divided by the sum of the mass of Sun and Jupiter. So this is the uh, astronomical value of the mass ratio. And this is the correct value. I mean, this is the astronomical value of the eccentricity of the orbit of Jupiter about the Sun. Sorry, and uh, what we, sorry, I have a very sensitive mouse. So uh, what we show in uh, uh, this work is that uh, there exists a perturbation parameter, which again, it's eccentricity. So there exists a epsilon one, uh, such that, and there exists a constant rho, which is a uh, such that for all epsilon perturbation between zero and epsilon one, there exist trajectories such that the change of energy over time, starting, you measure the energy at time zero and you measure the energy at some final time capital T, the change of energy is bigger than this constant rho, which is independent of epsilon. So the constant rho here is independent of epsilon. And um, I can have this, the same constant rho uh, for each perturbation parameter epsilon between zero and this threshold value epsilon one. Of course, that uh, whenever I fix a smaller and a smaller epsilon, I'll find a different trajectories that is uh, achieving this change of energy. And it also, it will take uh, more and more, longer and longer time to achieve this energy change. Um, so in this work, uh, we use a, a semi-analytical argument. So it's not, uh, so the numerics is very precise, but it's not like a computer assisted proof. But also, it's uh, not a very quantitative result in the sense that um, this uh, smallness parameter, this range of the smallness parameter given by epsilon one, we don't have a precise estimate for it. So it's not the true value of the eccentricity of the orbit of Jupiter. And we do not have estimates on uh, the diffusion time capital T, and we don't have estimates on the distance row that we can travel. Uh, so I will focus on this result because it is uh, 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 easier to explain. It is more intuitive. Uh, but I'll mention the uh, more general uh, result that uh, we obtained in a separate work with Maciej Kapinski. So uh, for this uh, uh, work, we we considered a, a different system. So instead of Sun Jupiter, we consider uh, Neptune and Triton. Uh, Triton is a, a moon of Neptune, and it's one of the uh, uh, celestial bodies with uh, a very low eccentricity of the orbit. So uh, this is the mass ratio for the system, and this is the true value of the eccentricity of the orbit of Triton about Neptune. So uh, we proved the same type of uh, uh, diffusion phenomenon, but uh, this time uh, we uh, provided additional uh, uh, 
uh, information about the dynamics as well as quantitative estimates. So first of all, uh, we proved that uh, there are trajectories for which we have a large energy change. So again, there exists a row and such that for each epsilon parameter between zero and epsilon zero, but now epsilon zero is the true value of the eccentricity, it's not like a, a very small number. There are trajectories for which the uh, energy from some initial time zero to some final time t is uh, at, at least rho. And we also obtain estimates of the diffusion time. So the diffusion time is of the order one over epsilon. So it's a constant times over epsilon. But in this work, everything is explicit. So the parameters of the system are realistic parameters, but also all of the constants that we see here, we have them explicitly computed. We also obtain symbolic dynamics. So uh, here we want to grow uh, the energy uh, beyond a certain threshold, but uh, if we want to make uh, uh, excursions in energy, so if we give ourselves uh, a uh, sequence, an infinite sequence, if you wish, of energy level sets, of course, between some bounds, we are able to find trajectories that move uh, from epsilon or order epsilon close to one energy level set to the other uh, prescribed energy level set and so on. So you can move between energy levels uh, any way you want and with precision of order epsilon. And uh, so this is uh, what is called symbolic dynamics, or in other words, you have like chaotic, we have a, uh, there exist uh, uh, initial conditions for which uh, you have chaotic behavior of, of uh, the energy along the trajectories. And we can even provide estimates in terms of how big are these sets of initial conditions. So uh, we, it, what we have uh, is an estimate on the Hausdorff dimension, and we can show that uh, the Hausdorff dimension of uh, such orbits, I'm talking about the initial condition of such orbits that execute uh, symbolic dynamics, is greater than four in the five-dimensional uh, extended phase space. So what is the five-dimensional extended phase space? So you have, you are, we are in the pl planar problem. So you have uh, two coordinates for position, two coordinates for momentum, and the uh, fifth dimension is the time which you consider as a variable. And uh, we also have, um, uh, we also show that uh, we can find uh, a diffusion process. In fact, we can find any diffusion process that we want. So if we uh, prescribe a uh, Brownian motion with drift, and we are free to choose the drift parameter and the standard deviation, so uh, we can find uh, uh, trajectories for which the energy along uh, along these trajectories uh, follow this uh, Brownian motion with drift. So, uh, of course, here uh, what I have, uh, I mean, there, there are lots of, let's say, uh, technical aspects that I'm going to uh, 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 skip for the time being. So uh, you have to uh, rescale the time in, in uh, some suitable way to get this diffusion process. Uh, we can only move between uh, some, um, within some energy range. So basically we have to put some stopping times if we go away, if we uh, move out of this energy range. But uh, besides these technicalities, what you get is that um, uh, you get initial conditions. So for each epsilon, so this is more or less the statement. So for each epsilon, you find uh, a set of initial conditions, omega epsilon. Uh, this has a positive uh, Lebesgue measure for each epsilon fixed. 
such that if we uh, follow the uh, trajectories starting uh, with these initial conditions, you look at uh, their distribution over time and you let the epsilon parameter tend to zero, what we, you get in the limit is the uh, diffusion process, the Brownian motion with drift that you chose. So in other words, uh, our work is uh, sort of uh, in agreement with the Chirikov experiment saying that one may not expect a single diffusion process, but one uh, should expect many diffusion processes and which will depend on the in sets of initial conditions that that you make. So, uh, so the the first uh, result with uh, uh, Kapinski and Ayave, and the second result with uh, Kapinski are uh, related. But as I said, in the uh, second result, uh, we have uh, explicit uh, estimates. So all of the uh, parameters that appear in our statements are explicit. And also, um, um, the, the uh, numerical methods that uh, we use are uh, validated. So uh, what we obtain is a computer-assisted co computer proof. So what is behind uh, this proof is, first, there is like a geometric intuition. The, you get a geometric intuition, in fact, from, from let's say, from the previous work. And um, then we use uh, topological methods to uh, uh, define certain uh, objects that uh, we use in the computer-assisted proof to uh, to to, to derive the, the dynamical properties. And the computer-assisted proof is based on the CAPD library developed by uh, 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 the uh, group of people from um, Krakow under uh, the leadership of Professor, Professor Zgliczynski. So all algebraic operations are performing interval arithmetic. Uh, the integration of the differential equation is uh, interval-based, and all numerical solutions are obtained with uh, rigorous bounds. And uh, what I want to emphasize, because uh, sometimes people use computer-assisted proofs in different ways, so sometimes you see, uh, let's say, some uh, trajectories in a numerical simulation, and you want to confirm uh, in a rigorous way that what you see is what you get. So our results are uh, valid for all epsilon as small as you wish. So if you make epsilon fantastically small, uh, imagine, I don't know, 10 to the negative 1 million, you are not going to be able to show such trajectories in numerical experiments. We are able to prove that they would exist diffusing orbits, even for uh, extremely small parameter, but uh, this comes from like a, a geometric argument, not by directly observing such orbits. So uh, I will, uh, as I said, so we have, there are two results here. And the first one, uh, we didn't do a computer assisted proof, uh, but this is the one that I think uh, uh, is more intuitive and more uh, geometric. So I'll try to give an idea about the, the argument uh, behind the first result. So this is a, when we use geometrical methods, topological methods, and um, some non-rigorous numerics. So uh, let me uh, explain a little bit what is the geometry of the planar circular restricted three-body problem. So this is the unperturbed problem. This is the problem for which the energy is preserved. So the epsilon parameter, which is the eccentricity, for now it's set to zero. So uh, typically uh, one finds that for, for this problem, um, you find a particular equilibrium point, a particular uh, rest point that is um, 
uh, surrounded by uh, periodic orbits, so one periodic orbit per energy level, and in this picture the periodic orbit is uh, the very small black periodic orbits that you see uh, kind of in the back. So this is a periodic orbit about one of the uh, equilibrium points. So this is an equilibrium point that is hyperbolic in the sense that uh, you have a stable and unstable direction associated to this periodic orbit. So this is the so-called Lyapunov periodic orbit, and you can show uh, that uh, for uh, each energy level, close to the energy level of this uh, uh, equilibrium point, there are such uh, uh, periodic orbits, and each periodic orbit being hyperbolic, it's it has stable and unstable manifolds. One, so this is, again, this is a picture in which the uh, periodic orbit is tiny and the stable and unstable manifolds are in uh, green and red. So one can also show that uh, these stable and unstable manifolds uh, intersect transversally and uh, uh, one way to show this is to intersect these manifolds, which are two-dimensional cylinders with a, a plane of section, and the intersections are circle-like. So the fact that uh, these cross-sections of the stable and unstable manifolds intersect, uh, as in this figure, uh, shows that uh, you have transverse intersection of the stable and unstable manifold of the periodic orbits. So, uh, for some parameter value, this has been proved uh, analytically. For some other parameter values that are more realistic, when it's able to see this through uh, numerical methods, including rigorous numerics. So, these are known facts that uh, happen for the planar circular restricted free body problem. So, now I'm going to describe. Uh, more objects associated to this problem. So uh, this is uh, the equilibrium point that uh, I mentioned before, and this is a family of periodic orbits around this equilibrium point. So uh, there is one periodic orbit per energy level. So if you fix an energy range and you put together all of this family of uh, periodic orbits, they form a so-called uh, normally hyperbolic invariant manifold, which I'm going to uh, uh, refer to in a second. And uh, what is this? This is what you see in the picture. And you can describe it by a suitable system of coordinates, which are like uh, polar coordinates. So you have an angle, and you have a radius, but uh, a symplectic kind of radius, which is called the action. So the action, it's a proxy for the energy. So for each energy level, you have one Lyapunov orbit, one periodic orbit, which is described by one fixed value of this action coordinate. So what is a normally hyperbolic invariant manifold? So essentially, uh, it's a, it's a manifold which sits inside a bigger manifold. So in our case, the bigger manifold is the phase space of the free body problem. And the uh, normal hyperbolic manifold is this collection of uh, periodic orbits. And normally hyperbolic, it means that the, the tangent bundle uh, to the whole manifold can be split into three parts, a part on which you have uh, exponential expansion, uh, a part on which you have exponential contraction, and another part which is, let's just say, neutral. Uh, more precisely, you, uh, so this is sometimes called like the center part. So in the center, you may have contraction or you may have expansion, but it has to be at rates that are dominated by, by what happened in the transverse in the other direction, in the normal direction, which are the hyperbolic, stable, and unstable direction. So this is a definition 
of the normal hyperbolic invariant manifold for flows, there is a similar definition for maps that I'm not going to uh, go into. So this is the, the structure that we have. So we have a normal hyperbolic invariant manifold, which is just a collection of periodic orbits. And uh, this has stable and unstable manifolds, and uh, they intersect uh, transversally. We have more geometric uh, structures associated to the stable and unstable manifolds of, uh, of this uh, NIM, of lambda zero. So lambda zero is the NIM, which is the collection of periodic orbits. These are uh, foliated by a stable and unstable manifold of points. So these are like uh, one-dimensional curves. And the, these stable and unstable manifolds of points are not invariant, but uh, they are equivariant, which means that if you uh, apply the flow to the unstable manifold of one point, it's the same thing as uh, you apply the flow to the point and then take the unstable manifold of, of the base point. So the fiber, so the idea is that stable fibers are taken into stable fibers, unstable fibers are taken into different unstable fibers by the flow. So you can also have uh, projections uh, along this stable fiber. So for each point on the stable fiber, you can follow the fiber up to lambda zero, uh, up to normally hyperbolic invariant manifold. So these are the co canonical projections that I'm denoting by omega plus and omega minus. So uh, let me assume that, uh, so in the case when the stable and unstable manifolds intersect transversally, which is what happens in the uh, restricted three body problem, then uh, 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 you have this restriction. So you have a homoclinic intersection. You have a homoclinic manifold. And uh, if you uh, restrict these uh, projections to the homoclinic manifold, what you get, you get local diffeomorphisms from the homoclinic manifold from the intersection to a normally hyperbolic invariant manifold. So these are uh, local diffeomorphisms, but you can further restrict this uh, homoclinic intersection in order to get a uh, diffeomorphism. So it's a diff diffeomorphism. Each uh, projection is a diffeomorphism from uh, this uh, restricted homoclinic manifold to a subset of the normally hyperbolic invariant manifold. So uh, this restricted homoclinic manifold is called homoclinic channel. And again, this is nice because these projections restricted to that are diffeomorphisms. So that means that uh, you can go uh, in both directions. So um, here it's a different picture. So this is the homoclinic channel. and. Uh, this is the normal hyperbolic invariant manifold. And here are uh, some of these uh, stable and unstable fibers. So um, what you can do is for each point in this homoclinic channel, X, you look at the uh, unstable fiber that contains it. So th and you mark the uh, foot point of the unstable fiber, X minus. You also look at the stable fibers that goes through this homoclinic point X, and you mark the foot point X plus. And you can uh, now uh, have this uh, mapping from the normal hyperbolic invariant manifold to itself. X minus goes to X plus. So this is called a uh, the scattering map. So uh, this map is defined on some open, typically on some open subset of the NIM of the normal hyperbolic invariant manifold to its image. And it's a uh, uh, geometrically defined by this, uh, 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 by the way the stable and unstable fibers intersect with one another within the homoclinic channel. 
this is a geometrically defined map and uh, what is the dynamics associated to this map so whenever you follow a homoclinic point so if you homo follow the homoclinic point in backwards time it will asymptotically approach the uh, foot point the uh, unstable foot point uh, it uh, followed by the flow in uh, backwards time and if you follow the homoclinic point in forward time it will asymptotically approach um, the uh, foot point followed in uh, forward time so uh, what I want to say I mean let me summarize it in, a, in so this uh, scattering map is does not give you uh, actual orbits of the system but it helps you to uh, find homoclinic segments that uh, for which you understand more or less the behavior and it has been proved in papers by their sons Ayave and Sarah that if you uh, work in a Hamiltonian setting if you uh, this uh, scattering map is uh, symplectic and uh, uh, they, they are similar uh, tools that uh, people have been using. So uh, in uh, Shatar and Zeng uh, developed something similar, which I think they call it uh, the return map. But uh, this phenomenon here is that also related to what people uh, call asymptotic phase. And there are some words by Chicon and uh, du Mortier on asymptotic phase that uh, are more or less in the same spirit. So uh, I've only talked so far about the uh, unperturbed problem, the planar circular restricted three body problem, when the perturbation parameter epsilon is uh, epsilon equal to zero. So, and you have two dynamics. So you have an inner dynamics on the normally hyperbolic invariant manifold which is uh, just that you move around these periodic orbits with some frequency. So it's just rotation at uh, a frequency depending on the action variable. But you also have uh, outer dynamics, which is described by the scattering map. And the outer dynamics uh, turns out to be uh, just a shift in the angle. So if you follow the homoclinic and you come back, and you encode this information by the scattering map that I uh, defined before, you are just going to come back to the same periodic orbit with uh, angle shift or phase shift. So this is the unperturbed problem. Now uh, you want to see what is the effect of the perturbation. So uh, this is the perturbed Hamiltonian from the, for the elliptic restrictive three-body problem. And uh, epsilon is the perturbation parameter, and you only retain, you only focus on the first order term of the expansion in terms of epsilon. Um, now, this depends on time, so uh, what is convenient to do is to make the time into uh, a variable. So you work in the extended phase space which is five dimensional, the time being the fifth variable. And uh, you, first of all, uh, the objects that I defined before, the normally hyperbolic invariant manifold and its stable and unstable manifolds have natural extensions in this extended phase space. And now you apply the perturbation. So you apply the perturbation in the extended phase space. So you, uh, you use uh, the standard theory of uh, a normal hyperbolic system, which appears uh, in the uh, works of uh, uh, Pugh and Schub uh, and um, Fanny Schell. So basically, they say that uh, the orbits that you found in the uh, unperturbed system uh, will survive in the perturbed system for all sufficiently small perturbation parameters. So we do this, so we have a, a surviving normal hyperbolic invariant manifold, 
and its associated uh, stable and unstable mass. Further, we reduce this to a um, uh, to the dynamics of a map by taking Poincaré sections, and again we have now for the uh, return map you have an inner dynamics for the normally hyperbolic invariant manifold associated with the discrete case, and also you have a scattering map. So now from the flows you go to maps and you have the same objects. Normally hyperbolic invariant manifold, inner dynamics, outer dynamics that is given by the scattering map. So uh, the scattering map is uh, computable uh, at least up to order one in terms of the perturbation. So uh, this is again going back to works by Del Sams, De Ave, and Sarah. So you can expand the perturbed scattering map in terms of the unperturbed one. And uh, at the first order, so this is the first order term, it's uh, perfectly computable. So it's given uh, by um, a uh, Hamiltonian vector field. And the Hamiltonian that generates the scattering map is given by a uh, Melnikov type of computation that uh, requires you to take an integral of the perturbation along orbits of the unperturbed system. So geometrically, you only have to compute uh, a significant uh, homoclinic, you have to compute homoclinic orbits of the unperturbed system, although you are interested in the perturbed one, and uh, you compute the effect of the perturbation on the orbits of the unperturbed system uh, via these integrals. And this is, uh, let's say, numerically, this is very easy to do. So you have uh, basically uh, one improper integral, and uh, the improper integral is uh, fast convergent. You, you do one computation, and this computation uh, tells you what is the scattering map up to order one. So based on this computation, you can uh, predict what will happen with the perturbed scattering map. And um, it's uh, worth mentioning that you uh, typically have uh, many homoclinic intersections, and you have many scattering maps, and in fact, in this work, we use uh, four scattering maps, and uh, we show that uh, uh, these uh, four, that these scattering maps have a, uh, let's say, behavior of interest for us. So basically, uh, uh, in order to, let me maybe show you um, this, uh, so I'm going to show you on the next slide what is this uh, uh, perturbed scattering map in coordinates. So in coordinates, the effect of the action variable, which is a proxy for the energy, is given by the uh, partial derivative of this uh, S, the Hamiltonian generates the scattering map with respect to theta, and the uh, behavior of the scattering map in terms of the angle is given by the uh, derivative of this S with respect to I. We are interested here in the first one and not in the second one. So this equation says that if you want to move in the action, you want to have a, a non-trivial effect in the partial derivative of S with respect to theta. So if this partial derivative is negative, then you will increase by order epsilon in the action and if it's positive, you will decrease in action by order epsilon. And this is uh, what we do numerically. We, we find uh, four uh, uh, homoclinic channels, four scattering maps. And uh, what we show is, so the, these homoclinic uh, channels are shown on the top uh, figures. And the bottom figures show you the following. The horizontal axis is uh, the angle coordinate, and uh, the uh, vertical axis represents the derivative of S 
the uh, function that generates the scattering map with respect to theta. So we want this to be uh, negative in order to uh, be able to move up in the action. So if I look at the panel in the middle, it shows that no matter, I mean, sometimes this uh, is positive, sometimes this derivative is negative. So you see, it goes above and below the horizontal axis. But uh, what is important for us is that for each angle, you are always going to find one of these uh, two families of curves, the red or the green one, which for which the derivative is negative. So if you want to keep increasing in action at each angle variable theta, you choose uh, the scattering map, in particular the homoclinic channel, which gives you uh, the negative der partial derivative with respect to theta, which according to this equation on the top will give you an increase in the energy of the action. So, and uh, basically uh, imme from what immediately follows is that uh, uh, you can make these uh, successive jumps by uh, using one scattering map or the other to jump epsilon by epsilon by epsilon and you can do this as much as you want. So um, this in principle tells you that you find, uh, let's, let me call them pseudo orbits of by applying either one scattering map or the other scattering map that move you up in energy or in action by order one. But uh, what I said before is that uh, the scattering map is not the same thing as the true dynamics. So the scattering map is geometrically defined, but uh, as associated to the scattering map is a homoclinic orbit which really means that you have to not only follow the scattering map, but you also have to follow the inner dynamics. So you have to combine the inner dynamics, the one restricted on the normally hyperbolic invariant manifold, and the scattering map to produce true orbits. So let me put it in this way. You have to glue together scattering maps, different scattering maps, and segments of the inner dynamics in order to get true orbits. And uh, we have uh, two uh, shadowing lemma type of results. So uh, they are saying that uh, it's an abstract theorem. So uh, let me just say, uh, without getting into all details, is that uh, if you have pseudo orbits that consist of applying scattering map, inner dynamics, and scattering map again, uh, under some restrictions, which uh, you will find true orbits that approximate these pseudo orbits. So what, I opt what we obtained before, we obtained some pseudo orbits that achieve change of energy, which is of order one. This type of lemma uh, will say that um, you find uh, next to these pseudo orbits, you can always find true orbits. So, uh, all right. So, in fact, uh, uh, we use this lemma in combination with another shadowing lemma, but uh, because I'm uh, sort of uh, approaching uh, the end of my allotted time, I'm going to skip this. I think uh, the first lemma that I showed you uh, gives enough enough intuition to uh, to sort of, uh, let me say it again. So we obtained before pseudo orbits that consist of applying uh, successive scattering maps. And uh, we can need also to use the inner dynamics. And uh, this lemma says that um, such pseudo orbits can be well approximated by true orbits of the system which, in fact, will conclude the proof. 
So if you have pseudo orbits that change in energy uh, by some quantity, we, you will get true orbits that uh, change in energy by, let's say, the same quantity. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about the argument uh, behind the, the proof of this shadowing lemma. And uh, this is the topological uh, mechanism which uh, we call the method of correctly aligned windows. Uh, you also find, uh, so uh, the main reference is Lichinsky and myself. Uh, instead of windows, we call a different, we use a diff different terminology, which is H sets. And instead of correctly aligned windows, uh, we, we use, um, uh, uh, a different terminology, but uh, the phenomenon is the same. Covering relations. Covering relations, yes. Thank you. So, uh, what is a window? So, a window it's a uh, multi it's a multi-dimensional uh, rectangle uh, for which you have uh, two um, particular direction. One direction is like an ex uh, like a topological expanding direction and the other one it's a topological contracting direction and they do not have to be of the same uh, they do not have to be of the same dimension so um, and this uh, rectangle comes with some parametrization and correct alignment so you have two rectangles and we say that uh, these two rectangles or these two windows are correctly aligned with one another under the dynamics if the image of the first uh, window is uh, stretching across the second window in a uh, topologically non-trivial way, and for instance, one can use the Brouwer degree to explain what this uh, uh, non-trivial stretching amounts to. So, but uh, geometrically, it's pretty much like in the picture. So what I want to emphasize is that this uh, Stretching and uh, contraction are not uh, are not supposed to be. They do not have to be of uh, uh, hyperbolic type, of exponential type. They are just a topological uh, type of expansion and contraction. So essentially, it means that uh, you just uh, uh, get a uh, the image of what first window by by the map is going across. I don't know, the second window. So uh, one of the main results that uh, we are using in this uh, argument uh, for the shadowing lemma, but also in the computer assisted proof with uh, uh, Maciej Kapinski is that if you have uh, infinite sequence of windows that are correctly aligned, then there is always a trajectory that uh, uh, visits these uh, windows in the prescribed order. And uh, this correct alignment, it's robust in the sense that if you apply a sufficiently small perturbation, correctly aligned windows remain correctly aligned. So uh, this is an advantage when we want to use numerical methods and in particular computed assisted proofs. So uh, once we have this machinery, we uh, use it to prove uh, this uh, uh, shadowing lemma that I mentioned before, saying that if you have uh, pseudo orbits that uh, are obtained by applying the inner dynamics, the scattering map, and the inner dynamics again, and here maybe I should stress that you have to apply uh, the inner dynamics for sufficiently large number of iterations. So there is a, a, a technical condition that uh, I'm sort of uh, uh, skipping. Uh, then there are uh, true orbits that follow the, these pseudo orbits. So the system is not hyperbolic. So as I mentioned before, we have hyperbolic directions, but we also have uh, center directions. So the center directions are corresponding to the action and angle coordinates. So 
what we do, we construct uh, uh, these windows, which are uh, uh, rectangles of the same dimension as the uh, full face space, and uh, we verify their correct alignment. So, uh, and sometimes these windows are correctly aligned by the uh, scattering map, and sometimes they are correctly aligned by the inner dynamics. And uh, uh, this is how we construct them. And uh, basically, the expansion direction, let me start with the contraction direction. So the topologically contraction direction is the hyperbolic one. But the topologically expanding direction uh, incorporates both the hyperbolic expanding direction and the center direction. What does it mean? It means that uh, whenever uh, I take the center of component of one window and I apply a mapping to it, I choose in the image of uh, this center direction a smaller center component of the next window. So this is the flexibility that is uh, embedded in the topological uh, method of uh, correctly aligned windows that uh, these expanding and contracting directions do not have to be um, hyperbolic. So you can get expanding by uh, choosing a uh, bigger object that, uh, and a smaller object inside. So the bigger object is the image and the smaller object is the new window that you construct at the subsequent step. So uh, basically, I, I rushed through this in order to explain how this uh, 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 method of correctly aligned windows is used to prove uh, one of the shadowing lemmas that uh, we use in the work with um, professors Kapinski and Ayave. But in fact, uh, we use a more sophisticated version of this windowing method in the computer-assisted proof of Arnold diffusion with uh, Professor Kapinski in the subsequent work, which was like the rigorous proof plus quantitative estimate. So I think uh, I managed uh, not to take too much extra time, so I'm going to uh, uh, apologize for the extra time that I took and stop here. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm going to uh, allow everyone to unmute themselves. One second. Okay, you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Marian. Is there any question or comment for uh, for Marian? Um, so I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I, I was just a little bit confused on this one point, and maybe this is obvious, but uh, when you're talking about this coding uh, that goes on when you transition to symbolic dynamics, um, like there was one example very early on, but we talked about it again later. Um, a little bit? Yeah, there it is. Okay, great. Um, th this isn't like saying that the system is like conjugate to the shift map, is it? It's just like the idea that like there is some time I can take between each where you'll you'll go. It's, it's more like a, a Markov petition, right? Or no? You're muted, Maria. Oh, no. Um, okay. Uh, ask you to start your video. So do you see my screen? Because I got the, the host and ask you to start your video. We can see your screen. OK, just making sure. So uh, it, well, it's not exactly like uh, conjugacy, because uh, you have these energy uh, levels, and you try to visit them, and it will take a different amount of time to uh, move from uh, one energy level to another. But in fact, you visit uh, this uh, energy level with, with some error that is uh, of order epsilon. But uh, again, uh, 
I feel the urge to uh, emphasize that in this work, uh, when we say order epsilon, we mean uh, epsilon times an explicit constant. So everything in this work is uh, as explicit as, as it can be. So, um, so, it, so we follow a flow, okay? So to move an energy level, it will take a, a variable amount of time to go from one energy level to, to another. So uh, I, Yeah, I, I don't think it's the natural way to, to describe this via a conjugacy or semi-conjugacy, but it seems to be possible if you make some, uh, let's say, uh, maps that uh, go from one strip of one neighborhood of an energy level to another. So I don't know if I answer your question or I should. Uh... Yeah, I think I think that that's got it. Um, it's just that like. Uh, part of the reason uh, I'm, more, I'm I'm thinking about this is: Do we have explicit time maps? Yeah, like just integrating forward. Uh, I, I'm thinking like the the inner dynamics and the outer dynamics seem to suggest to me we have some time uh, estimate for very small epsilon, but that might not. That might so, not. Uh, we do have, uh, first of all, we do have, so if we want to uh, diffuse of, uh, if you want to change the energy by order one, by a constant, mm -hmm. we have explicit uh, upper estimates of the diffusion time. Um, when we want to uh, uh, visit uh, uh, different energy levels of the energy, uh, of course that, uh, the, the 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 more time we move uh, through, so if if we want to do lower estimates of the time and also upper estimates of the time, um, then uh, uh, these two bounds will become uh, naturally more and more uh, apart from one another. The the more time we follow these trajectories, so we do get explicit estimates on the time, but uh, Let's just say these estimates, uh, in a way, uh, get worse and worse mm -hmm. uh, the more you let these trajectories to, to flow over time. Uh, but in fact, in the construction of the um, diffusion process, we uh, really need to have this type of uh, time estimates, and uh, we uh, we obtain such estimates. So, so uh, my uh, uh, co-author, uh, Professor Kapinski here, uh, uh, if he wants to complement or add anything at any time, he, he would be more than welcome on my side. Okay, so I'll, and as well if Professor De La Llave, if he wants to comment on uh, any part of the work, I'll not, uh, I'll be more than happy. Thank you. Any other questions or comments or, or answers? Um, Professor, hi. So does that mean that even pseudo all orbit has a uh, level size? All kinds of orbits have level size. I, I mean, ha have uh, energy that. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, th that is a very good point. Uh, and indeed, we obtained first. Uh, uh, estimates on the pseudo orbits, and uh, based on the pseudo orbits, we use uh, we we call the theoretical machinery to find information about the true orbits. So the pseudo orbits move between level sets, and then it follows that the true orbits uh, move between level sets of the energy. That's a very nice point. Thank you. There's uh, one more question. Can I speak? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Mariam. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's very, it's very clear. And um, I have a couple of questions. One is uh, uh, actually three questions. Uh, 
so the first one is that I didn't understand which is the role of L1. So the elaboration point L1, and if you can generalize it to, well, L2 is obvious, but rather L3, where you should have uh, indeed the hill approximation instead of the three body problem approximation. The second one is uh, whether um, you can consider systems uh, which have uh, different parameters because you choose a triton which has uh, a small eccentricity. But what about if you take other systems which have larger eccentricities? How, how optimal could be your methods uh, and uh, applicable also to other systems? And the third and last question is, uh, uh, what about instead of considering uh, the eccentricity as a parameter, you consider the inclination. That is, uh, that you consider the, the receipt, planar restricted the circular three-body problem, and then instead of uh, switching on the eccentricity, you switch on the inclination. Uh, th th there, are, th there, there could be several reasons for that, uh, for this question, so. Uh, thank you for your questions, Alexandra. A very nice question. So, uh, the first question was, uh, what is the role of L1? So, uh, L1, L2, L3 are uh, equilibrium points of uh, uh, saddle center type. And uh, we, the, the center part is what gives us the normally hyperbolic invariant manifold, and the saddle type is what gives us the stable and unstable manifold. So, uh, uh, Maybe I can uh, refer to this picture that I didn't actually explain before. So what really happens is that uh, for different, in the unperturbed problem, for different energy levels, you have uh, different periodic orbits and you have uh, uh, stable and unstable manifolds that give you homoclinic from each periodic orbit and back. Uh, this is what we use for L1. Uh, but when you apply the perturbation, the, 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 what we actually verify is that you can move from, let's say, if you have this uh, energy level as frozen, when you turn on the perturbation, you can move between this energy level. So you can go from a smaller periodic orbit, you follow uh, the uh, stable and unstable manifold, then when you come back, you end up with a slightly bigger a periodic orbit and you repeat and you repeat and you repeat. Each step will uh, make a small jump in energy, but uh, overall you can uh, choose initial conditions for which these uh, small jumps accumulate to a large jump. So uh, we can definitely uh, uh, do it for L2. Uh, we did not explore, we did not think about L3, so I, I don't want to uh, speculate on L3. Different parameters. So the, the second question is, uh, we chose uh, in the computer assisted proof, we chose uh, Neptune Triton system uh, because um, of the small, very small eccentricity. So uh, now it's uh, uh, the time to sort of uh, uh, confess about the secrets. <laughs> so when we started this work, uh, we're uh, not uh, very confident that we can handle uh, large values of the eccentricity. So that's why we chose a system which has uh, very small eccentricity. So in the first stage of this work, we, we couldn't even reach this level of eccentricity. But uh, my collaborator, uh, uh, Professor Kapinski performed uh, a series of miracles, performed lots of uh, magic, not only on, uh, in the computer-assisted proof, but in uh, terms of geometric ideas that uh, allowed him to uh, reach this level of eccentricity. And I believe that uh, uh, from, from this moment on, we can go to even larger values of the eccentricity if, if we choose to. So, but of course, this will require to actually do it as opposed to uh, being optimistic. But uh, the methods have been, uh, uh, well, they have been uh, Im improved quite a lot, but uh, since we started with the Neptune Triton system, 
we we were stuck with this, so we proved everything about the system. And the third system is about inclination as opposed to using the inclination in the spatial problem as opposed to uh, the eccentricity. And uh, we have a paper with uh, uh, Del Sams and uh, Roldan about uh, 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 diffusion in the spatial restricted three body problem. Uh, I'm not sure if this is exactly uh, uh, the type of mechanism that uh, Professor Celetti uh, has in mind, but uh, at least we, we looked at the problem of diffusion in the uh, uh, spatial, the three dimensional uh, three body problem. Yeah, of course, okay. if you are talking about eccentricity and res uh, eccentricity and inclination, right? The, there is the famous lead of cos uh, cosine, right? Resonance, exactly, right? yeah. Yeah. That you could be moving. Actually, we have a lot of indications that uh, phenomena like this are happening, right? I mean, uh, we have several people here in Georgia Tech that are working in this area, right? Uh, um, now, that's a very good problem, I think. So, sorry. So, you, you, the, yeah. The, in fact, the idea was uh, to um, uh, to connect uh, the uh -huh. the results of the eccentricity with those uh, the inclination through the lead of cosine the integral, which is uh, yeah. This is uh, one of the problems that I think it's uh, is uh, ready for pickup. I mean, you know, now that you have a very very big machinery and the machinery is written and working and prove rigorously and numerically efficient, right? There are many problems that you can get, I mean, before. Uh, so this is certainly one of the, in my opinion, interesting ones, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you see, that's why you see, I mean, this is, I think, the beauty of, uh, this is the beauty of this work and, and the other, and all the things is that it opens new fields and opens new problems rather than, uh, right? So the, the work is, uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get all this presented, because this is something that opens the floodgates, not uh, closing. Uh, thank you for the great questions, and also thank you for the suggestion, I think. Uh, yes, we did not look at uh, inclination and eccentricity together, so yeah. that's a good problem. Any other questions or comments for Marian? Last one? No? If not, let's thank uh, Marian again. Thank you. And I'll see you all again.